Nyquist theorem says that we can accurately reproduce analog signal in digital domain if we satisfy at least two conditions. Signal we sample is band limited and we will sample it at at least double of its original frequency. Obviously, there is a lot more to that, but in order to push this video further we won't dive as deep into this and we will only skim over the most important principles. If you wish to expand on this topic, there's a fantastic video made by Alec from Technology Connections that I will link in below. So now, when we know that in order to accurately reproduce sound we need to take only chunk of its whole frequency range, we need to find out how to limit that upper portion of frequencies, and this is usually done with the help of low-pass filters. In Akai S950 samplers, filtering is done with the help of MF650 filters, which according to the datasheets are 6th order switched capacitor Butterworth filters. Butterworth design has very flat frequency response and order of the filter dictates how steep its roll-off is. In this case, 6th order means that it's 36 dB per octave. Altogether, each voice in Akai S950 has one filter IC in its path. That gives us 8 filter ICs on the output side and one additional filter on the input side. These filters are controlled by separate clocks. Main mix, voice 1, left channel and the input channel are receiving clock via first clock bus, FCK0. Rest of them are being clocked via succeeding FCK bus tracks, so voice 2 is fed by FCK1, voice 3 by FCK2 and so on and so on. It is worth mentioning that FCK4 feeds voice 5 as well as right channel output. All of these buses are being supplied by programmable MicroPD8253 timers. There are three timer chips on a voice board and each of them supplies three separate clocks. After we find out the clock source and the path it takes to reach the filter, we can finally think about how to inject our own clock signal. But before we do that, it is better to do a little probing and testing. After we choose and locate the filter chip, it is time for a dive into its datasheet to find out the pinout and which of those pins are responsible for receiving the clock signal. As mentioned before, both input and mine output filters are connected to the same FCK0 bus. Since we can't record and play samples at the same time, there is no need to adjust both filters independently. This saves Akai headache of routing additional clock bus to the input filter. Frequency cutoff of a filter is strictly dependent on the bandwidth of a sample. The lower bandwidth of a sample, the more filter will close in order to prevent unwanted high frequency garbage coming from our DAC. Likewise, the higher sample rate of a sample, the more filter opens allowing a broadened spectrum of a signal. At this point, it is a good idea to compare different bandwidth with the corresponding clock speeds and create a table to have visual representation of those. To my surprise, clock speed and thus filter cutoff frequency changes in steps every approximately 2 kHz. This means that the cutoff frequency of a filter for a sample at let's say 16 kHz is the same as for a sample at 14 kHz. The way filter works in program edit though is quite different to its normal operation. First of all, the top threshold for the filter is set by sample bandwidth. That's logical because there is no need to open filter more than is required by the sample highest frequency. But when we start closing the filter manually via program edit, the clock speed and the filter cutoff point changes every several steps until it reaches level of approximately 6 kHz which is equivalent of value of 65 on a filter cutoff scale. After reaching this threshold, the filter is adjusted at every single step to the cutoff threshold of 325 Hz, value 25 on the display, or clock speed of 15.7 kHz, which is the absolute lowest of what Akai clock will send to its filter. Below that threshold, the clock and filter cutoff remain constant, so there is no point adjusting filter in program mode below value of 25, as it has completely no effect on a filter cutoff. So to recap, if you think about it, Akai S950 firmware can set the filter to only 50 out of 99 different cutoff points and its most useful and precise range lives between values 65 and 25. Anything above that will make filter cutoff changes too drastic between steps and anything below that makes no effect anyway. Now we have to make our own clock source. This can be achieved in many ways. We can use crystal oscillator, any of the shelf oscillator ICs, use Schmidt trigger circuit or even make a simple 555 timer circuit. Upside to such an approach is that it is possible to smoothly sweep between different frequencies in real time with the help of a potentiometer. Downside is that each approach required multiple additional components and in some cases negative power supply. This doesn't make it suitable for beginner users and also create risk of shorting internal components and potentially destroying the unit. That's why, for the sake of this video and simplicity at the same time, I will use Arduino microcontroller based on that mega chip. 
There are plenty of flavors of Arduino board, so I decided I will use the smallest and the cheapest one, Arduino Nano. For beginner users, it will be the most easy and affordable option, as it pretty much doesn't require any additional components, nor any knowledge on to how to make schematics. Putting the Arduino code together is quite simple. In order to generate the required square wave clock, we just need to tell Arduino to quickly turn on and off a certain pin at desired rate. Right? Right? Turns out that I slightly overestimated this board because in normal operation, despite having a 16 MHz processor, 62 kHz is the maximum normal user can take out of it. This is due to how Arduino IDE interfaces with its microprocessor by translating human readable commands into computer code. In other words, each command in Arduino takes too many processor clock cycles in order to perform at speeds that are required. Luckily, it is possible to interface with microprocessor and it clocks directly by clever use of microcontroller interrupt. This allows to run pieces of code at full speed outside of the main code loop, which can give us frequency boost from 62 kHz up to 8 MHz, and that is far more than required. Since the Arduino is sending the clock at level of around 4.5 up to 5 volts, it is recommended to put one uh, 150 ohm resistor between ground and pin D9 of the Arduino board to drop voltage to around 3.6 volts. Filter data sheets state that it works on TTL and CMOS level signals, so we should be fine up to 5 volts. But since the original clock is running at approximately 3.5 volts, it is better to be safe than sorry. Once this is done, it is also time to add two buttons to pin D2 and D3 of the Arduino. They will increase or decrease the frequency of a clock coming out from pin D9 of the board, which will be connected to the chosen clock bus on Akai motherboard. As for injecting an Arduino clock into S950 system, the easiest way is to cut the boost track anywhere along the clock path. Add switch that will select between the original clock signal and our own clock, connect both clock signals into the switch and enjoy selectable clock source. Since I've chosen voice number 1 to be modified, there is a nice spot on the mainboard right next to the original clock source. In this case, Akai is sending clock via trace that goes from pin number 10 of micro PD8253 chip. Trace goes on top side of the voice board under the chip and then is routed to the bottom side through VIA that is conveniently located right next to the chip. All that is left is to cut the track just right before the VIA where our clock disappears under the board and from here inject our own clock as discussed before. Now, when everything is connected, it is time to put theory in practice and check if it works at all. Let's sample something random at quite low bandwidth of let's say 6 kHz to give our mod a lot of room for aliasing in upper parts of the spectrum. At this point, sample is quite muddy and heavily filtered out. In normal circumstances, bandwidth of a sample would dictate filter cutoff point, which at the moment is set to around those 6 kHz. After quick flick of a switch, it is possible now to override this and hear the results. The first to notice is that the sample becomes much brighter. Some people say that it's also losing some of the bottom end or its meat, but that is just a false perception as we only perceive less bottom due to introducing more of high frequencies. Once the mod passed the test and it's working the way it should, it is time to find a nice spot to put the Arduino board inside the chassis. Depending on the complexity of the modification, such as type of clock circuit driven it, amount of filters to be driven independently, use of potentiometers, or even a small OLED display, it could be potentially required to drill the hole in a faceplate or make an external box that sits on top of the unit. In this case, I've decided to make it as simple and bare bones as possible so I can fit it inside installed Gotek drive, which will make it quite stealth and not stand out too much. I've added both buttons and switch to the front panel of Gotek and attached everything with a bit of hot glue. Since Gotek system draws way less power than original mechanical floppy drive, I stole some power directly from where the connector meets the PCB. If you decide at any point in time that you wish to update the firmware or add any functions, Arduino Nano should automatically select power between external and USB in case both are connected. 
Since it is hard to trust cheap Chinese knockoffs sometimes, it is highly advisable to upload a new firmware only when the whole S950 sampler is switched off. Now, after everything is assembled and completed, I thought it would be a nice idea to hook it up via any random connector instead of hardwiring it to the board. Thanks to that, it is more easy to remove the Gotek drive at later time if needed, and in case of some critical failure of the drive itself, we can simply disconnect it and bridge the connector with a jumper wire or breadboard pins, which will restore the system to the original state. And voila! All done and dusted, we can enjoy fully completed project. As mentioned at the beginning, despite the mod in this video will give you required results, this video is intended to plant the seed rather than being a step-by-step -step tutorial. A lot of things were omitted or completely simplified, so if you wish to expand on this project or take a different approach, it is recommended to understand the way the circuit and Akai circuit works before doing it. In the future, I'm planning to make another unscripted video where I will ramble about different approaches with a couple of codes that didn't make into this video. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this one, thanks for watching and until next one, bye bye.